So turn your Bibles to Matthew 25. Again, one continuous message known as the Olivet Discourse. Uh, this long sermon is a result of the disciples coming up to Jesus and they ask him some questions about the last days. Specifically, they wanted to know when their beautiful temple is going to be destroyed because Jesus had just told them not one stone would remain upon another. It was all going to be ruined. It was going to be desolate. And then they also asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, once again, they assumed all of these things were going to happen all at once. In other words, they thought, hey, when our temple is being destroyed, and that's when the Romans came in under General Titus in 70 AD, when he's wiping things out, then Jesus is going to come back. He's going to wipe out the Romans. He's going to establish his kingdom on earth, and we'll all live happily ever after. That's what they are thinking at this point. But Jesus has been showing us, no, these things are going to be divided up into different sections. As we saw, Jesus divides the, their question into basically four parts. Part one was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. One million Jews were destroyed during that invasion of Jerusalem. It was brutal. Part two describes the signs of the last days. Jesus talked about in the last days there will be wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, earthquakes, famines. We've always had those, but it's in the last days these things are going to ramp up. And he uses the, uh, the illustration of a woman who is pregnant as she goes into labor. The contractions get stronger, more intense, just before the baby is born. Jesus also said that the end is not yet. So we're seeing those signs around us today. Things are ramping up. I talked about the earthquakes. You know, in 1890 to 1900, there's like one major killer earthquake in the world, and it stayed like one every 10 years, like one or two or three, one or two or three, you know, in that range. And then the last from 1970, it goes up to 50-something. In the 80s, it's, you know, 70-something. Today, it's over 200 in this decade, so they're ramping up in intensity, so signs of the times. Part three is where Jesus describes the Great Tribulation, which is the time of God's wrath and His judgment that He pours out upon a Christ-rejecting world. He says in the middle of that Great Tribulation, middle, midway point of the seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, is the abomination that causes desolation. In chapter 24, verse 15, He says, when you see this, well, none of these disciples saw that. They didn't see the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple, says, I am God, worship me. That hasn't happened yet. That's still in our future. And so after the great tribulation, Jesus says, I'm coming back in power and great glory, and everybody is going to see when I come back. He's not coming visibly. In fact, he says, if somebody says, oh, he's out in the desert, he's in this inner room, he says, don't believe him. Because when Jesus returns, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. It's not going to be some secret little thing. He also, we looked at the rapture. That is kind of a secret thing because he descends in, you know, from heaven in the clouds. He's going to meet us in the, we're going to meet him in the air. He doesn't come to earth at the rapture. That's when he says, nobody knows the day or the hour. We know when the second coming is 1,260 days after the abomination of desolation. We see in Revelation, it's 42 months after the abomination of desolation. Time times half a time, that's three and a half years. So we know when he's coming back at his second coming, but nobody knows when the rapture is going to happen because it's going to happen just like that, in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. And so we looked at those uh, last time in Matthew 24. Um, we'll look a little bit more about that as well this morning. So we need to be watching. We need to be ready. That's one of the things he talks about in this Olivet Discourse. We don't know when he's coming back for the bride, so we need to be ready. As we come into chapter 25, he gives us a couple of very powerful parables that will emphasize the need to be watching and to be ready, to make sure that we are truly born again. And he's going to give us another parable about using the talents, resources, that he has given us while we wait and watch. We see the perfect balance in this section that we look at this morning with these two parables because some Christians think, oh, Jesus could come at any moment, so I'm just going to kick back and sit here twiddle my thumbs and wait for the rapture. That's not right. Because 
he wants us to occupy until he comes. He wants us to be about the Father's business until he comes. And that's what the second parable is all about, is using his resources that he has blessed us with for his glory, to reach out to those around us, to get the gospel out to as many people as possible, because nobody knows the day or hour when Jesus comes for his bride. So look at chapter 25, verse 1. This is, again, continuing through chapters 24 and 25. It's just one message. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Again, when he says it's like this, it's likened unto this, this is a parable. We don't build doctrine on parable. Jesus gives us the parable here. We'll look in a moment at the doctrine that Paul gives us concerning these things. But one of the beautiful things about verse 1 here is Jesus compares his coming to a wedding. This tells us his perspective of all these events. This is from his perspective. It's like when Paul talks about the husband-wife relationship there in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loves the church. Wives, be in submission to your own husband as unto the Lord. It's a picture of Jesus and the bride, his church. In the Jewish culture in Jesus' day, weddings and marriages were very, very significant. They are today, but more so back then. They had different phases in their um, the way they arranged marriages. They were prearranged for the most part in Jesus' day. You'd have two kids, and it was always a boy, it was always a girl. <laughs> right? They weren't ever questioning, okay, uh, we've got a daughter here, a daughter. No, it was always our son here, he's three years old. Our daughter here, she's three years old. So when they get older, they're going to get married. So they would prearrange this. Well, Paul talks about that in Ephesians 1, 4, where it says, we've been chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. He knows who's going to be his bride. Then when those two little children grew up, they're like 15, 16 years old. About a year before the actual wedding day, they became in, uh, spoused or betrothed together. The espousal betrothal was a legal legally binding marriage, but they could not consummate the marriage until the wedding day. And so this was a legally binding thing. This is why they could be stoned to death if they committed sexual immorality. This is why uh, Joseph wanted to put Mary away secretly, it says, when she was found with child. She was going to just, you know, he was like, I don't want to see her die because she could have been stoned to death because she's pregnant before the wedding day. And so the angel Gabriel intervenes, he shows up, and he says to Joseph, hey, this, that which was in her, is of the Holy Spirit. So don't be afraid to take Mary to yourself. Paralambano, remember we talked about that word, to take in intimacy. Jesus is coming for us. One will be taken, paralambano, the other left. So he takes Mary to be his wife, even though she was pregnant. Very important deal. In fact, um, the angel Gabriel, he intervenes. Uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that I have betrothed you, speaking of the church, to one husband, to Jesus Christ as a chaste virgin. The marriage hasn't been consummated. That happens when we get to heaven. Don't think weird stuff. I mean, this is just spiritually speaking. But now we are betrothed to Jesus. It's a legally binding relationship that Paul says we've been betrothed to him. It was also during this, uh, this espousal period that the husband-to-be would go to his father's home and he would start adding on a room. That's what the Jews would always do. They'd add on a room to their father's house. And then only the dad knew, only the father knew when he was going to say, go fetch your bride. And it could be at any time he'd tell his son, go fetch your bride. Well, this is very significant because this is exactly what Jesus says. Nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the son. Only the Father in heaven knows when he's coming for his bride. What is Jesus doing right now? He's adding on to the Father's house, so to speak. This is what he says. Look at this verse, John chapter 14, starting in verse 2. Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. 
That's what the son was to do. He was preparing a place in his father's house, adding on because of the bride that was going to be coming. So I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. Another interesting thing about the Jewish wedding was that when the groom brought his bride back to the father's house, they would stay in that added-on room for seven days. The, the bride would stay in there for seven days. The groom would come and go, and he would come back with things. He'd pamper his wife, but he'd come and go and bring her whatever. You know, just they would enjoy that time. After the seven days, then was the presentation when the groom and his bride would come out of that home and say, hey, here we are. And everybody would be like, yay. That's like everybody welcome the bride and groom. Well, Jesus is going to hide us away, his bride, for seven years, not seven days. That's when the Great Tribulation takes place. Revelation 19, Jesus comes out of the Father's house, so to speak. When you read Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, it says he will descend from heaven, and all of us, his bride, clothed in fine linen, white and you know, clean and bright, will be following him on white horses. We'll be presented to this world when we come back with him, and then he will establish his kingdom on earth. So a lot of symbolism within this parable. Again, even here in verse 1, we see these ten virgins had lamps with them. Uh, these would be little oil lamps, and that was because the groom would often be sent to fetch his bride after the sun went down. That's the beginning of a new day for the Jews, and they could come at any time that night. And so they had to be ready with their little oil lamp. And we'll see the important thing was they needed to have this little bottle of oil with them to keep their lamp burning. And that's very important because then she could signal when the groom was sent forth, go forth and get your bride, then the bride would be able to say, I'm watching, I'm ready. The oil lamp was burning. So um, be prepared. That's the main part of this parable. Be ready to meet the Lord. One way or another, we're all going to stand before the Lord, whether at the rapture or if we just die natural causes if i just keel over today when i'm done or while i'm here that'd be weird wouldn't it i don't know pastor chuck used to always say hey if i ever you know keel over here behind the pulpit don't anybody wake me up don't anybody do cpr on me just let me go i want to be with jesus because if i go home to be with jesus then you resuscitate me and i wake up and i see you i'm going to punch you in the nose because i want to be with jesus so anyway i understand what he's talking about well, we got a couple doctors in the house. Do what you need to do. If God wants me to come back, I'll be here. So anyway, verse 1 again, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them are wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept again this parable is about being prepared five of these virgins were foolish five of these virgins were wise the five foolish notice had no oil the five who were wise had their vessels of oil the five who were wise are like the ones we looked at last week in the parable remember the the wise servants you know they were doing what god had called them to do they understood the parable of the fig tree they, they realize that the fig tree represents Israel coming back to birth. May 14, 1948, that was a sign. God showed us that he is not done with the nation of Israel. Uh, he mentioned there being ready, like if you knew when the thief was coming, you'd be watching and ready, right? And so that was the wise ones. Here, the five foolish were like the unjust steward, the unfaithful servant. Remember what we saw last time. He mistreated his fellow servants. He was beating them. Ah, my Lord's gone. He delays his coming. And so he was just living his life for the flesh and the things of the world. They have no fear of the Lord in their hearts and minds. Now, what does the oil represent? Almost every time you talk about oil in the scriptures, it represents the Holy Spirit. Remember when Aaron was being anointed for being the high priest, Moses and them, they poured oil over him and represented the Holy Spirit coming upon his life. These five, you know, wise virgins, 
They have the oil. That simply means they have the Holy Spirit. They are saved. They're born again. The five without oil, they represent the unsaved. This is what Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says. Very important verse. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of God, that's another name for the Holy Spirit. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, again, another name for the Holy Spirit, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, He is not His. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes into your life at salvation. He seals you into the body of Christ. He, he declares you are righteous. He causes us to be born again. It's the Holy Spirit in us. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not saved. He's the one that brings us to salvation through Jesus Christ. It says He seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Nobody can break that seal. We're safe and secure because we are in the Lord. The seal is that stamp of ownership the Holy Spirit puts on us, that we belong to Jesus. So this parable of the ten virgins, again, it's a picture of those who are genuine believers, the five with oil, but the other five, they're not genuine believers. They look the same, five or ten virgins. On the outside, they all look the same. But one group is saved, the other group is not. But notice all ten virgins, it says, slumbered and slept. In other words, we can all get lulled into a sense of thinking, well, maybe Jesus isn't coming back this year. Maybe it's going to be five years from now. The only problem with that is you can put your faith into neutral, so to speak, and you just kind of go through the motions. You just kind of go on with your life, not really watching, not being prepared. Listen, we need to be careful. Now is not the time to hit the snooze button on God's spiritual alarm clock. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, in addressing this very issue, Paul says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. He's speaking to the believers there. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You know, we're that much closer to seeing our salvation completed. That's glorification. We're not there yet. We're in process. We're saved. We're justified. But ultimately we'll be glorified when we get into the presence of the Lord. So we're that much closer I'm 44 plus years closer to when I got saved. Praise the Lord, he waited till November 30th, 1977. Some of you are like, well, I'm glad he waited till whatever date, 1985 or 1990 or whatever date you got saved. Praise the Lord, he waited because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so again, living in that state of anticipation should keep us focused on the Lord, no matter what is going on in this life at this moment. Today could be the day when the bridegroom is told by the Father, go fetch your bride. I can't wait. Look at verse 6. And at midnight... A cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. The door was shut. When I read that, it reminds me of Noah. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago, too, when Noah goes into the ark. God told him, build the ark, he, then when he's done... Just before the judgment comes, he tells you know all the animals, get in the ark. And then he tells Noah, you get in the ark, your wife, your three sons, their wives. And as soon as they got in the ark, it says, God shut the door. The Lord shut the door behind him. Here we see the door was shut. The same is true today. Only those who are in Christ are safe and secure from his coming wrath 
and judgment. Those who are not in Christ, they're not saved. And if the rapture took place today, the, those left behind will enter into the great tribulation. Notice also, when the midnight cry sounded out, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Only those with oil, only the genuine believers, went into the wedding. Those without oil, the unsaved missed out. Notice that they're begging the wise virgins, you know, give us some of your oil. They couldn't. In other words, you can't give anybody the Holy Spirit. You can't save anybody. We can't do that. All we can do is present Jesus Christ to people. We can't fill someone up overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus can. So this is really a good illustration between those who have a real relationship with Christ and those who are just simply religious. Religion cannot save you. Jesus Christ can save you. Good works cannot save you. Jesus Christ can save you. Each individual must come into a personal relationship with Jesus on their own. I can't do anything for anybody. I can point you to him, but only he can save you. You have to admit, I'm a sinner, Lord. I can't save myself. I can't do enough good works to earn salvation. You come humbly to the Lord and say, Jesus, I need you, and he will save you. He will come into your life. He did all the work for your salvation. Nobody is saved because you're sitting here in church. No, none of you are saved because you have a Bible. None of you are saved because you were singing these songs this morning. You're only saved because you are in Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. Paul makes this very clear. You're familiar with these verses, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. None of us are going to say, well, look at all these things I did for you, God. Wasn't I wonderful? <laughs> He'll say, you can't boast in that. No, we're saved by His grace. Paul says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Before I got saved, I earned a lot of wages, sinful wages. And what was going to be my reward? Death. That's what we all deserve because we've all sinned against the Lord. But the gift of God, the free gift, literally free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember what the Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He didn't give them a big list of to-dos and to-don'ts. Do's and don'ts. He just said, believe in Christ. Put your faith in Christ alone. Simply acknowledge you are a sinner by nature and by deed. Realize that there is nothing you can do to save yourself. Here's another one, Romans 3.20 because people want to justify themselves by the law. Well, I try to live by the Ten Commandments. Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law, this is the whole purpose of the law, is the knowledge of sin. You know, Paul tells Timothy, the law is good if you use it lawfully. How do we use the law lawfully? Well, this is God's perfect standard of righteousness, the Ten Commandments. And you look at that and you go, oh, yeah, I kind of missed that one. Yeah, that one too. Well, you know what? I pretty much missed every one of those. I've blown it. And, and James says, if you're guilty of one law, missing one law, guilty of one point of it, you're guilty of the whole thing. So none of us can save ourselves by trying to keep the law. The good news about the law is it does point us to the only Savior, Jesus. That's why the law is so good. It shows us you have sinned against the Lord. It shows you you have fallen short. It shows us I didn't always honor my parents. You know, I, I coveted things for my neighbor. You know, I, I used the Lord's name in vain. I mean, there's a lot of things I did before I got saved that I'm not proud of at all. But those things, they, get, they condemn us, but they can never save us. So why is the law given to bring us to Jesus? One of my favorite verses is Galatians 3, 24 and 25. It says, therefore, the law was our tutor, instructor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. He's written the law in our hearts now. 
So we don't have a list of, oh, I got to make sure I keep these Ten Commandments. No, the Ten Commandments is all fulfilled in Jesus. He's the only one that can live out the Ten Commandments perfectly. He says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Only Jesus did. He fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, every little piece of the law. He fulfilled perfectly. And now that Christ is in me and I am in Christ, he looks at me as like, yep, the law is fulfilled in you because of Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's a tutor to bring us to Christ. And notice, after you've come to Christ, you're no longer under the tutor. Praise the Lord. We're not under the law. It doesn't mean we're lawless. It just means we're under a relationship now with Jesus Christ. So look at verse 11. Afterward, the other virgins came also. These are the five unwise virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know you. Does that sound familiar? Sounds exactly like what he told the religious people in chapter 7, Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. This is what he says to the make-believers, the unsaved. Look at these verses. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Remember when the people came to Jesus in, Math, or in John chapter 6, what must we do to do the works of God? They want to know what kind of good works, what kind of laws do we need to keep to get saved? That's what they want to know. Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe on him, Jesus, whom the Father has sent. If you want to call it a work, then that's it. It's just faith. You believe in Jesus alone for your salvation. So, Lord, Lord, shall we not, you know, not everyone who says this will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, for us it means put your faith alone in Christ alone. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? They like to throw Jesus' name around a lot. And done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Same thing he says here. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those have got to be the most devastating words any unsaved person will ever hear. Standing before Jesus and him saying, I never knew you. Depart from me. This is one of the reasons the Apostle Paul exhorts the church there in Corinth. Now, you remember the Corinthian church is a lot like the church in America today. A lot of carnality, a lot of compromise. They were true believers, obviously, in Corinth, but he tells them, this is 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Take note of this verse. Paul tells the church there, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, you, uh, unless indeed you are disqualified, how can we test ourselves? Well, we need to ask ourselves, am I living for Jesus? Is he number one in my life? Have I trusted in Christ alone for my salvation? Am I walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Or am I just doing my own thing in my own flesh, living for the world? I can't answer that for you. I can't tell somebody that claims to be a Christian, no, you're not, or yes, you are. Only God sees the heart. That's the bottom line. Only you know if Jesus is sitting upon the throne of your heart, now, we can have that assurance of our salvation. That's what you know. John tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I write to you that you may know that you have eternal life. I know where I'm going, but it's not because of anything I do. It's because my faith and trust is in Jesus Christ alone. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're good with God simply because you're coming to church or you read your Bible or you pray sometimes or you're on the right political side of things. No. The only difference between those ten virgins, half were sealed with the Holy Spirit, half were unsaved because they did not have the Holy Spirit. The emphasis, once again, is be watching, be ready, for Jesus is coming for you and me. Now look at verse 13. Again, he says this. He says this many times in the Olivet Discourse. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So this parable, this is Jesus' parable about these things. Now you want to see the doctrine of this? 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We'll read these through together here. This is Paul's wonderful commentary on this scene. But concerning the signs and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Remember, we talked about that last time. Nobody knows when he's coming back for the bride. He says, if you knew when the thief was coming, you'd be sitting in your house, shotgun in hand, <laughs> just waiting for him to come in the door. But we don't know when Jesus is coming. And then as we go through this, notice Paul will make this distinction between they and them and us, we, you. He makes a very clear distinction here. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, when they say it, when the world says, oh, good, we finally have utopia. We've created this utopia on earth. The World Economic Forum, that's what they're proclaiming. We're going to create this utopia on earth. And everybody, we've heard this phrase from them, everybody will own nothing and you'll be happy. Why? Because they're going to own everything. That's, not, that's socialism. We'll see in a moment. God entrusts everything he has to us, so we don't own anything, but it's all his. Socialism doesn't acknowledge God, so they say, it's all mine. I get it. I'll let you have it, you little peon. So anyway, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. These are the, un, the, you know, the foolish virgins. They, they're left behind. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You, again, the believers, you are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So the fruit of the Spirit, very important. You know, we need to walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. The full armor of God, he mentioned some of that here. We need to keep the armor of God because we are in a spiritual battle. And then he says in verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, praise the Lord, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So again, that's the doctrine. Jesus gives us the parable. We who are in Christ, we're children of the light, sons and daughters of the day. We're not appointed to the wrath of God, but we've been given the free gift of salvation through the death of Jesus. His blood shed on the cross is the only acceptable payment for your sins, for anybody's sins. And because he rose from the dead, he alone can offer the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will come to him by faith. So, the rapture, the day when Jesus comes for his bride, will not come upon us as a surprise as it does upon these foolish virgins, the five who do, do not have the oil. So now we move for, you know, from this parable to the parable of the talents. This is the perfect balance. Again, we're to be watching, we're to be ready, but we need to be occupying until the Lord comes. Here's how Paul says it in Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, and we got a lot of opportunities in the world around us today, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Again, the only way we can live out our lives the way Jesus wants us to is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not trying to do things in our own flesh, because without the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, then we would quickly, as he mentions here, grow tired, we'll get weary, we'll burn out. That's why we need to continually go to the source, the Holy Spirit, who fills us up, refills us. Only you can answer this question. Are there rivers of living water flowing out of your life? That's what Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes. 
your heart will flow out rivers of living water. Maybe it's just a little trickle right now. Maybe it's just a little drip, drip, and <laughs> drip. We've all been there. We're the ones that grieve and quench the Spirit. And so he says, humble yourself. I'll pour the Spirit into you and He will flow out of you if you'll simply humble yourself before the Lord. So keep that in mind as we go through this parable. Look at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like, once again, that's how we know it's a parable. It's not this, but it's like this. A man traveling to a far country, we'll see this man is Jesus, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Again, the disciples would recognize this right off the bat, because this is very common. You'd have a wealthy landowner, and he would leave. He could be gone for months because he's traveling all over, doing all of his stuff to bring back whatever he's going to sell. And so he's gone for a long time, but he puts his stewards, his servants in charge of all of his goods until he came back. And the steward, again, owns nothing of his own, but he's supposed to take good care of what was entrusted to him by the owner. In the same way as Christians, we own nothing of our own, but we've been entrusted with everything that the Lord has given us. He's entrusted to us many blessings. Again, that's the difference between Christianity and socialism. A lot of people try to say, Christianity is socialism if it's really practiced. No, it's not give me yours. I want yours. It's like, no, whatever I have is from him. So I want to be a good steward over what he's entrusted to me. And and so there's a whole different dynamic there. So verse 15, And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So he gives different talents to different people. Now don't think of these talents like, oh, they've got a talent to sing or dance or you know, be an athlete or something like that. This is not like America's got talent. That's not the talent he's talking about here. A biblical talent is a measure of wealth, and it was measured in weight. A talent is about 75 to 100 pounds. Interesting, because during the Great Tribulation, one of the last judge it actually is the last judgment, Revelation 16, verse 21, I think it is, the last verse in that chapter, God sends a talent of hailstones or a hailstone weighing a talent upon the unbelievers. That's one of the horrible judgments. 75 to 100 pound hailstones falling out of the sky. Crazy. Anyway, in this context, a talent is measured by weight and value. A talent of gold, a talent of silver. That's a lot. So one talent would equal about 20 years' salary. So two talents is about 40 years' salary. This guy given five talents is like 100 years' salaries. That's a lot to take care of. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. A lot of talents, a lot of weight, a lot of valuable that he has distributed to us. So notice also the master gave to each one of these servants according to their abilities. In other words, God is the one who created us with different gifts, different abilities. Um, You know how some people thrive when it comes to numbers and math and finances. They think, oh, this is so great. And I'm like, whatever. Yeah, I mean, everybody's gifted differently. God created all of us. He created all of us very differently. As we'll see, whatever he has entrusted to us, bottom line is make sure you're using it for his glory, not for yourself. This is important for parents to think about. If God has blessed you with children, it's because he wants you to raise them up in the ways of Jesus. He's entrusted those little ones to you. They're not yours. Elizabeth is not mine. Elizabeth is basically on loan from God to me. And so he's going to, I have to give an account for how I treat his daughter first and foremost, my wife. But when you have that perspective, it gives you a little bit more clarity like, yeah, I got it. She's from the Lord. You know, and I, I can't abuse that. Same with the children God has blessed us with. We need to encourage them. Um, encourage them to be whatever it is God has called them to be. He wants you to be engaged in your children's life, to nurture them, to love them, uh, to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord, the ways of the Lord. So that's what it means to be a good steward. 
Whatever job he has blessed you with, do your job as unto the Lord. Be faithful as an employee. If you're the boss, be faithful as the employer. You know, that's what he says in Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. That kind of summarizes it, how we're to live. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 4. Look at these verses, verse 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. That's what Paul means here. The Lord has entrusted to him, in this context, the mysteries of God refers to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul knew he needed to be diligent and faithful in order to share the gospel with as many people as he possibly could. I mean, this is why Paul is one of the great heroes of the faith. I mean, he wasn't going to be stopped. You know, they'd beat him up. He'd go through shipwrecks. He'd be stoned and left for dead. They would throw him in prison. But he had to keep going because he knew, i got to keep sharing the gospel. It, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. By the way, Jesus has entrusted the gospel to all of us as well. We're to be good stewards over the word of God. He's called all of us as his saints to be light and salt. That's what it boils down to. Are you being faithful as a steward to live out your Christian life for his glory? Are we being faithful with what he has entrusted to us? You know, when I think of those you know, that pop into my mind when I think of somebody being faithful. I mean, Pastor Chuck was a great example to me, but I also think of people like jo uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Oh, man. It's been 55 years now she, since she went into the wheelchair as a, parapl or a quadriplegic. 17 years old. She you know, has a diving accident, becomes quadriplegic, and, you know, she thought, she wrote about it, I mean, she thought her life was done. God will never use her. Are you kidding me? She's written over 50 books. She's produced like seven movies, seven uh, albums. I mean, talk about faithful with what God has given her. And the amazing thing about it all is everything she does, she just gives all the glory to the Lord. It's all about His faithfulness. It's all about God's grace. It's all about His mercy and love. You know, I don't know how many talents God has given her, but she certainly gained many more for the kingdom of God. Uh, I mean, I would say she knows Jesus so much more than I do. I mean, it's, it, it's incredible. One talent, I, I'm thinking, wow, if I got half a talent, I'm pretty fortunate. <laughs> but it's, it's not the amount, it's what you do with what he's given you. So look at verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. After a long time, Jesus had been gone a long time, right? Nearly 2,000 years. But the time... When he settles accounts with us is going to happen. This is the parable. Paul gives us the doctrine of settling accounts. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Check it out. For we, speaking of the believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, not to be judged for salvation. That is the Bema seat. That's where we're rewarded for what we do for the Lord. That each one may receive the things done in the body. So how we lived out our Christian lives according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Not everything I've done as a Christian has been good. Not everything I've done as a Christian has been bad, but a lot of things aren't good. And so we'll stand before the Lord and give an account for what we've done with what he's entrusted to us. It's that simple. This is not for salvation. If you're at the Bema seat, you're saved. Don't ever forget that. So, as you know, the Bema seat is where all believers will stand after the rapture. This is where we go through the refiner's fire. Everything we do will be judged by fire. How do I know that? Well, Paul says this is the doctrine, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 13, but he's been saying, okay, Jesus is our foundation 
take heed or be careful how you build your life on Jesus. And then he says, because each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. He'd already mentioned as Christians, we you know build on the foundation of Jesus with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Guess what goes through the fire successfully? Gold, silver, precious stones. Guess what gets burned up? That's what he's talking about here. Hay, wood, straw. Those are the things we do as Christians that we did in the flesh, not in the power of the Holy Spirit. I've always kind of joked about it, but my goal is, as a body of believers here at Calvary Chapel, we, I hope we have one of the smaller piles of ashes when we stand before the Lord. You know, I don't want to be like, oh man, look at Jeff's mountain of ashes here. That would be a drag. Be that as it may, notice what he says. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, again, the refiner's fire of Jesus, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Again, the Bema seed of Christ is only for believers. Unbelievers stand at a different throne, right? The great white throne, that's sentencing day. That's at the end of the book of Revelation. But no Christian will stand before that throne. The neat thing is, he says, for those of us that go before the Bema seat, he will reward us. This is the crazy part, because he will reward us for what we did for him in the power of the Holy Spirit with what he's entrusted to us. And they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would he reward me? Because I can't do anything on my own. Well, guess what? You get crowns, and what do we do with those crowns? We throw them at his feet, because we recognize, you alone are worthy, Lord. I'm not worthy to receive anything. Eternal life, that's sufficient. But everything we receive from him, we'll just acknowledge he's the reason why we're so blessed. It's all because of Jesus. So look at verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. So in, in this sense, his 100-year wages, he turned into 200 years wages. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, he just used what God gave him for God's glory. His Lord said to him, verse 21, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 22, he also, who had received, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make, her, uh, make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So at the end of the day, that's what we should all want to hear. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. That, to me, that, that's one of the greatest statements of grace that any of us will ever hear. Well done good and faithful servant, because it was all his doing. It was all because of what he's blessed us with, he's entrusted us with. And all we were like, oh, okay, Lord, here I am, use me. Why would I get rewarded for that? It's all because of Jesus that anything good happens in us and through us. Verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, and it's not because he just had one talent. I mean, again, if I got half a talent, I'm fortunate. It's what you do with what God has entrusted to you. So here, this guy was given 20 years wage. I mean, he was entrusted with one. But he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. We're going to find out this guy is like the five foolish virgins. He is not saved. He doesn't really know Jesus at all. I was afraid of you. I didn't know you. you know, I, or I knew you as a hard man. I knew you as one who takes from somebody else and gives to somebody else. That's really sad because there's a lot of people that look at Jesus like that today. They have all kinds of wrong ideas about his love, his grace, his mercy. You know, If you think today that J Jesus is standing over you with a baseball bat, that's my analogy because I used to play baseball, 
And that's how I pictured God before I got saved. If there is a God, he's standing over me with a baseball bat, just waiting for me to do something, and then he's going to smack me. If you have that idea about God, you do not know the God of the Bible. Jesus didn't come to judge, condemn. He said, I did not come here. The Father did not send me to condemn the world, but to save the world. He came to pour out his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness upon you. These people are twist. This one guy here, he's twisting the nature and character of God to such a degree. You end up with a different Jesus. You end up with a different gospel because this isn't the Jesus who saves, who loves, who demonstrated his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One of my favorite sections here is the Apostle John says this in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 17. John writes, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment when we go to the Bema seat of Christ, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now, the proverb says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding and knowledge. That's having that reverential awe of who God is, and he could just wipe me out in an instant. But that fear of the Lord should drive us to Jesus. And then when we come to Jesus, he says, you know what, I'm going to replace that fear of what I could do to you with love, because he wants that relationship with us. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves torment. I knew what I deserve, Lord. I should be burned up in the lake of fire for eternity. But he's taken that fear away. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And when you receive the love of Jesus and you know you're saved by his grace, then you have that intimate relationship with the Lord that he created us to experience. Real quickly, verse 26, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Again, this guy's just an unbeliever. Verse 29, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness, the place of the unsaved. When we get to the end of Revelation, you find out that Hades and hell and the sea give up its dead and everything gets put into one final death place, the lake of fire. That's the end result for all those who reject Jesus Christ as Lord. So with God, it's all or nothing. It's life, it's death. Light, darkness. Come to Jesus. He alone can save you. He alone loves you. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy, but listen to Jesus Christ, who says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish or be destroyed, but have everlasting life.